remember when we went to buy a frying pan and then we bought a jumper and a scarf. Well, we still needed a frying pan. So we've got this one, but look. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Um, and I'm making like a chickpea pancake in it. So chickpea flour pancake, which is really good. You just mix uh, one part chickpea flour, one part water. So this is half a cup of chickpea chickpea flour, half a cup of water. And I think it's pretty much done. Oh, there it is on the plate. And then I've also got some tomatoes. Okay, I couldn't film and do the finishing touches. But here's my breakfast chickpea pancake. So it's got some um, tomatoes. I just briefly cooked them and some rocket, some nutritional yeast. A little bit of lime and some salt and pepper, and it looks amazing. Um, yeah, frying pan update. I forgot to add the most important bit, which is hot sauce. I'm reading the Jessica Simpson, so I've only just got this bit. Bought me this as a treat because I'd had a bad day. Um, but I am loving it. So we are on page. 119, I've only been reading it for a couple of days. It's super readable and it's super charming as well. And I love it. It might be the best book of the year. Um, while I also admit that, you know, you kind of need to have a little bit of an interest in Jessica Simpson. It's not going to be one that transcends <laughs> all, all interests. But that's my update. Going to eat my breakfast. Um, we're going to talk about books. Books we've read. read. We're doing a little vlog today, aren't we? Yes. Because I've got the day off. You go to the library. I go to Hardline's Coffee. We're going to have coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is what we did last time. Yeah. Yeah. So enjoy. But the books are different. Yeah, the books are different. <laughs> so... You go first, since you've read more than I have since our last... Oh, uh, okay. Oh, I was no? wondering if we should try with, start with this one, because we oh, both okay. read it. Okay. Oh, yeah, we did both read yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So that's Bad Guys by... Um, Aaron Blaby and we both read this one. Thank you, Anwen. Yeah, Anwen of uh, Soggy Expat <laughs> recommended She's it. She's our go-to uh, influencer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What did you think, Bobby? I loved it. Yeah. It's really good. I've ordered uh, the second book um, from the library. Is it ready today? Oh, it might be. Uh... I'm not sure. They're basically they're all the um, bad guy animals. So there's like a wolf and a snake and a, a shark. shark. And, uh, and a piranha, um, and the wolf has kind of got them all together to sort of um, they're going to be like the good guys club now, and they're going to go around sort of helping things. But um, their sort of true nature keeps coming through yeah. accidentally, so they keep just kind of scaring other animals and it's really wanting cute, to eat them it? and stuff. So there's a bit kind of quite at the beginning when they're trying to be good. This one here, mm. pop quiz. Let's say we find a cat stuck up a tree. What do we do? And then the uh, shark says, eat it. <laughs> and he's like, no, rescue it. Yeah, that's good stuff. It's really cute, yeah. isn't it? I've heard from uh, from Heather, though, that um, once the spider turns up, I think in book two, um, then it gets even better. Oh, so, gosh. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then I read, I've had like a bit of a weird reading time recently where I've felt, where I've gone days without reading anything and felt quite lumpy. And then you read the whole book in then a read, day. Yeah, and then read a whole book in a day. So that's been the theme. Yeah. Anyway, so I did read California Calling by Natalie Singer. A, um, it's a memoir about her kind of wanting to go to California. I think she's Canadian. Um, and, yeah, I liked it while I was reading it. But it hasn't been that long since I finished it. And I can't really remember anything much about it so yeah. it hasn't stuck with me um but I know that I enjoyed it at the time and I did give it four stars and I kind of um you know I like I liked how she wrote and I liked the stuff that she said but it's just not it's not stayed with me yeah. so yeah that happens yeah so that's that one and um, but maybe I'll go on straight away to the next one because I kind okay. of felt like they they did sort of go together mm. So this is um, The Light Years by Chris Rush, which is another memoir. And this one is a memoir kind of from the 60s and 70s mainly, isn't it? Because yeah. you've read it. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, Chris Rush sort of talking about um, realising he's gay um, and kind of how that affects his family. 
and yeah. not necessarily in a positive way. Is that I think they're trying to, they sort of send him away to like a, a school for priests. I think that mm -hmm. they don't actually ever say anything, but I think they're trying to yeah. get rid of him a bit, aren't Straighten they? Straighten him up. Yeah. And then there's lots about acid, lots about drugs. Yeah. So this is one of your favourite books. This was your favourite book last year. Yeah, I loved this book. I thought it was brilliant. It kind of came out of nowhere as well because he's not like a, you know, he's an artist. So he's, this is his first book. But it just felt like a, a really powerful, a really accomplished book. Mm. And I was, when I was in it, I was so in it. Mm. I was and hooked That's as well. quite rare, I think. Yeah. Mm. I really enjoyed it. I don't think I enjoyed it quite as much as you did. I gave it four stars, but I did really mm. love it. And then um, I liked his voice and it did, he's from quite a big family and it's, even though it's kind of the topics are a little bit heavy sometimes, yeah. um, he's got like a humour to it, hasn't it? And he's yeah. he's looking back on a long time ago as well, so I think he's got that kind of, um, you know, he's he's been through it, hasn't he? You know. And yeah, and he's got almost got the kind of had a bit of he's got a bit of a fondness for it now. Yeah. When looking back, although what he's gone through is just kind of pretty extraordinary, like living in the desert for years. Yeah. There's a whole sort of section on him really getting into sort of. UFOs and thinking that there's going to be yeah. UFO visitations and you know like he's pretty out there during this time yeah and, um, it's just fascinating you know? sometimes it reminded me right and of a bit of David Sudaris oh really in yeah. that kind of humor that sort of yeah. um finding humor in the kind of quite grim yeah. stuff as yeah. well the reason I gave it four stars um and maybe it's because I read it you read it quite quickly though didn't mm. you but I just found the the drugs kind of the talking about drugs quite overwhelming mm. in the end because it's quite um i felt quite worried for him because he's mm. he's really young he's like his sister gives him acid when he's about 12 mm. and then um he kind of just his parents just don't seem to care about him that much they're not they sort of they it feels like they love him mm. but they're very distant and they don't really mm. know where he is and he's like in a big family as well yeah. isn't he so and then he just ends up just taking loads of acid and then kind of gets into like dealing as well. And all of this yeah. is like, I mean, the end of the book is probably when he's, I don't know, in his early 20s, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So it's, yeah. yeah. And it's sort of, it's kind of quite cumulative. It sort of builds up and yeah. up, doesn't it? So I found it kind of quite um, upsetting, actually, mm. that the way that he was just not looked after, I guess, was what yeah. I bothered me more than the, yeah. more than the drugs particularly. Yeah, yeah. I just really cared for him the whole time, oh, yeah. and then I really loved him when I was reading it. And there's like, a, we'll, we'll, if we link, we'll link the. Um, there's a little, short, really short interview with him, which Sean showed me after she'd read it. And yeah, I just kind of he came across exactly as I, I imagined. Yeah. He's just, lovely, and yeah, I would, he's great. I would really recommend it. Very readable, really yeah. well written. Oh, it's brilliant. He's really into. I would definitely read more by him, yeah. and I did really love it. Uh, so I. <laughs> I was reading um, Trial by Battle, I'm not sure if I mentioned this one before, this is by David Piper. This is from 1959 and it's one of the Imperial War Museum wartime classics which everyone's talking about at the moment. <laughs> no one's talking about it. It's, you know, <laughs> I alone am fascinated. <laughs> I'm really into this series. I really enjoyed this. This is, um, so David Piper uh, kind of fought in World War II. Um, during the Malayan campaign, which I, I didn't know a huge amount um, about. And this is sort of a, you know, semi-autobiographical, so it, it does pretty much look like it is about his experiences um, fighting in kind of the jungles um, with the Indian army. Um, and yeah, it, it, the writing was what really surprised me. It was really well written. Um, the the character the um, so Alan Mart he's sort of twenty one years old when he's posted to India, and um, he's just a really uh, likable kind of character. He's quite he's quite um, he's more sort of scholarly. He's more he's not really what you'd expect as a sort of an army person, which I guess you know so many of the people that were you know conscripted at the time weren't. It gets progressively um, as you know progressively sort of heavier as the war sort of as they sort of go off to fight in the jungles and you know it's just like horrible warfare it's quite yeah the stuff that they would have seen is just like horrific and i think it's quite important to read these books either one that had like a interesting kind of 
yeah, it's I'll the say, only book yeah. he wrote, doesn't it? Yeah, so. so he's basically best known, it says on the back, as an art historian and museum director. He so acclaimed as the director of the National Portrait Gallery and the Fitzwilliam Museum and the Ashmolean Museum. So he's basically a massive like art museum curator guy, um, director. I would recommend if you're into that kind of thing, which you probably might not be, but if you are, it's really good. Someone might be. Yeah. Who's that team? <clears throat> I read... Um, this one, so it's the it's girl by girl. How I became J T. Leroy by Savannah Knoop. Um, and last year, me and Bert went to see the movie that this is based on, which has Kristen Stewart and Laura Dern in it, and we loved it, didn't we? <laughs> I just adore Kristen Stewart and Laura Dern. Yeah, but I adore Kristen Stewart more. You're mm. more adoring of Laura Dern, but she is amazing too. She is amazing. Um. It's a great film. Yeah, I really it's like the film. It's maybe, I guess, like a bit one-sided in... Because I think it's based on this book. It's based on this yeah. book. And this book, it's it's quite faithful to this book, actually. Yeah. So um, I enjoyed reading it. Again, I gave, I gave this one four stars as well. Um, yeah, but it is very much from Savannah Knoop's side. So Savannah Knoop was the person that pretended physically to be J.T. Leroy, although it was yeah. uh, the other, the writer... Cockney. <laughs> yeah, Speedy. yeah, Speedy. But I was wondering what was her re- what's her real name? She's oh, also called Laura in real life, uh, Laura Albert. Right. So Laura Albert, who's played by Laura Dern, is the person that actually wrote the JT Leroy books yeah. and um, in person pretended to be, be JT Leroy on the phone. So really, it's the Laura Albert is the one that kind of created the whole um, persona. Uh, persona. I was yeah. going to sort of say the kind of duping people really I yeah, mean it's, it's like mainly the, her the myth, the myth of yeah. JT Leroy so it is mainly her but then you know Savannah Knoop is, is obviously involved as well but she was a lot younger and it kind of does talk about how I guess you can get swept into these things and it, it started so small like um, Laura Albert just needed a picture of someone to put on the cover yeah um, and previously I was trying to look for this picture because Laura Albert was just would just phone all these writers all the time or people like Tom Waits as well. Yeah. So like all these famous people were like supporters of JT Leroy. But um, Dennis Johnson, mm. um, because Laura Albert as JT Leroy said they didn't want to have a picture of themselves on the back cover. Dennis Johnson gave Laura Albert a picture of someone he knew who had died right. as a young when he was quite young and right. said you could use that as a picture. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's. It's really interesting, interesting yeah. about creating myths and about these all these celebrities getting involved yeah. in it and in and kind of like the just before just pre-internet where you can yeah. maybe get away with it a bit more yeah, yeah. so it, she, there would be cracks in the stories that were obvious there f- from the start and she's kind of saying yeah people don't if you, you just present something confidently they will just go with it yeah um so i mean this was written straight after the the whole Thing came out. Yeah, you guys got. You haven't read any of the. No. Books. Has anyone read any of the JT Leroy? I know that Sarah has. Hardcover hearts. Hardcover hearts. Well, she had some stories. She had some she? great stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. really enjoyed uh, that. Yeah. Um, I read one of them and I thought it was great. And I, I think they, they will if they haven't already kind of been sort of reappraised just as a sort of them on their merits mm. aside from the whole side story. Yeah. I mean, there's interesting stuff around how, you know, a book should be just good on its own merit rather than having to have this backstory, yeah. shouldn't it? But there, there is the whole issue, basically, the you know, which is legitimate, is that well, it's kind of, yeah, it, it would be offensive to the, to the trans community yeah, because no, um, right. they've created a trans figure um, almost um, using sort of the, the experience of that but it being like a made up thing. Yeah. So yeah, they sort of almost got like created this trans figure with a lot of the kind of the the sort of the baggage that 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 experience might have might have had at the time and you know sort of the whole backstory of like yeah. sort of this damaged persona and stuff like that. and they you know and and so they've used much... it they've used it to sell something. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so it's, it, it yeah. It's horrible as well, yeah. isn't it? Um and that very much going against the whole own voices thing, isn't it? Yeah. As well. Beginning, they talk about the JT Leroy character. Um, they say that he is HIV positive as well, that he has AIDS. Um, and then, as it becomes more famous, they kind of just drop that bit. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. like, never mention yeah. it again. So, yeah. I mean, it, it it's kind of complicated. Um, there's sort of interesting stuff about Savannah Knoop. 
um, how how they identified as well, yeah, and how they were involved in it. Um, and I I do have some kind of sympathy with Savannah Knoop, but um, they're not very reflective on it or don't really touch on any of those issues that no. you've just picked up. They kind of launched a career based on it almost. Well, I don't know because the, I mean Savannah Knoop then went on to do like more um, performance art and. Yeah. Which is, fashion. you could say this fits into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an introduction that they've written when the when they're doing the film, so that's kind of interesting. Yeah. But I, I would have liked a bit more of that thing about being, it's very much being written straight after, yeah. this is what happened, but there's no reflection on how it's damaging in any way or yeah. um, how it's damaging to, to them as yeah. well. And yeah. Maybe they just don't see it that way. Which is fine as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Because I watched the interview with them as well and they, they were quite unapologetic about it. Yeah. And I think also felt used themselves, yeah. which is also kind yeah. of, you know, a, a valid point. Um, there's also a lot about their eating disorder in here, which didn't Wasn't come it, across uh, in the yeah. film. And I thought that was kind of quite interesting about... Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Rambling on and on. <laughs> what else have you got? Um, so then I read a... Well, I listened to an audiobook. Um, this was um, uh, Another Part of the Wood <laughs> by Dennis McHale. Um, I knew nothing about Dennis McHale um, when I got this from Borrow Box. It was, it was just one of those random Borrow Box um, things. I thought, oh, that, I'll go with that. And then I realised I do have a book by Dennis McHale um, on Persephone um, called Greenery Street, which I bought years ago and haven't read. Um, and will now want to read because I really enjoyed this book. Um, it was just super fun. It was very sort of P.G. Woodhouse, that kind of era, very light, kind of a bit farcy. Um, about a girl called Noodles, and she sort of gets sent off to like boarding school. She then she runs off with some Pierros and uh, her brother and her brother's best friend, who are called Beaky and Snubs. <laughs> Um, Noodles, Beaky and Snubs. Yeah, they sort of go and find her, and there's kind of a little sort of romance side to it. It was, it was super fun. Uh, I thought the narrator was really good. Um, there was like one issue in it that they, um, I felt they might have changed a particular word, which was used um, twice in the space of a couple of, you know, like one minute of the book, um, which I felt they might have, they might have either cut or it wasn't necessary. I could do an audio book, just cut it. Yeah. I got uncomfortable than, listening to it. Yeah, it's different than when you've got a book yeah. reissued, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I feel yeah. So I feel like it wasn't in any sort of um, it was it wasn't in uh, in used hatefully or anything. It was just the time, um, so it wasn't necessary. And yeah, but if you just look past that, it was you know it, it, I really enjoyed it. It was super fun. Um, listen to the audio book. It's really good. Another memoir. This is Love Lives Here, a story of thriving in a transgender family by Amanda Jet Knox. Um, and it's about Amanda Jet Knox, who um, is married with three um, children and then one of the children trans. Um, and it's about Amanda kind of dealing with that and also advocating for her child as well. And I thought that was really interesting part of it because I don't really I mean there's lots about sort of transgender kids in the news it gave me a much better understanding of yeah. what that means and I thought the way she wrote about her child going through that was really good and I thought really valuable for if, if this was happening to you in your family mm. I just thought this is such a great mm. resource just a positive take on that yeah because that's her whole thing as well is that yeah. she said she was looking for stories of something similar um, and only found neg negative things, and she wanted to talk about how her family actually got stronger. And then, interestingly as well, once the um, her daughter has then said that she's trans, um, Amanda's husband also says that she is a woman too. And so they then go through the, this process as well of, of coming out as a woman. And um, so really interesting story and I thought um <coughs> so the way that they talked about it was um was really good but I didn't really like the writing in it I gave it three stars in the end I thought the story was really important and I think it's going to be you know really helpful for a lot of people um all this happened to her she'd kind of had commented on Facebook posts about 
uh, transgender kids and about she'd said offensive things. So she would wanted to, I think it's for other mums like her really, it, it is who it's for specifically. Although, you know, great for anyone to read and it gave yeah. me, it did give me a really good understanding, especially around children. I don't think I've read anything about yeah. children, trans children. And the bit I, I kind of took away from it was that before um, her husband uh, came out as a woman and um, that they had quite a, even though they'd been married for 20 years, they actually struggled in their marriage because her husband was, um, well, her wife now, was quite unhappy. And then once that they became, they were able to be themselves. Yeah. You just talked about how happier the whole family was with everyone being able to identify as what they wanted. So I thought that was really lovely. Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah. It's something the parents have to learn from the kids, don't they? Yeah. So it, glad it's out there. Didn't quite work for me. Yeah. So I read um, another library book. It is Lunch with the Wild Frontiers. This is by Phil Savage, who I recognised but I wasn't really familiar with what he did so Phil Savage uh, so yeah the sub subheading is history of Britpop and excess in 13 and a half chapters as you can see from the cover and from the Polaroids inside it's kind of like a pretty much a who's who of of that scene at the time Britpop Phil Savage was a PR guy it still is I think um, and whilst the majority of this is kind of about that sort of Britpop scene, the Camden sort of scene. Um, it's not entirely, so I felt it was a little bit like the beginning and end I kind of lost interest in, and kind of the middle, where it's like the 90s, I was kind of really fascinated with. It's very anecdotal. Um, if you're interested in that era, that music, or those people, definitely get it out of the library. Um, he writes well, it's funny. Um, there's lots of really good anecdotes about, you know, like. Jarvis Cocker partying too hard or, you know, Brad Anderson just going around his house and being in his robe with like cigarettes and it's kind of, it was kind of what you want. Um, they don't all come across particularly well, these guys. Um, there's some good stuff about sort of Justine from Elastica. So it, it's very kind of gossipy. I really enjoyed it. I thought the beginning was a bit less interesting and then towards the end it, it kind of got a bit too, um, yeah a bit decadent towards the end and it was kind of a bit sort of all that money and drugs was kind of mm. all a bit disgusting towards the end all a bit cocainey very cocainey <laughs> very much like people just like chucking money at things and almost like yeah like laughing at how much money that they had and like using it for like nonsense mm. um and towards the end it, it sort of goes into like you know nightclubs and andrew lloyd webber and bollywood and stuff that i had a lot less interest in um, lots of really good stuff about suede in particular. So I think suede come out of this pretty well. Oh, do they? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of um, ambition in a lot of the bands that uh, it's kind of they were hidden. It was hidden because they were trying to be cool. So like Damon Albarn trying to find out like why suede were getting more front covers on Enemy and stuff like that. Uh... And just a lot of this stuff. But then, yeah, they were a little bit trying to be cool while at the same time, but actually being really ambitious. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, super fun. Right, suede is cool. He's just cool. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just get out of the library, maybe. But, um, yeah. Yay. And then my last one, I read Summer Glass Nerve by Manon Stefan Ross. And I'm so proud of myself for We're reading this. Proud of yeah, them. I read it in a day again. Um, so this is part of my dare we thought. You read all is... of these in a day, practically. Yeah, I know. And this is um, my first Welsh language novel I have read, I don't know. Let's say ever. No, I read some in school, but right. I don't think. I don't think I've read anything since school. So, um, first Welsh one, I was a bit worried that I thought I might struggle with it um, in terms of language because I don't read in Welsh and I think the way you speak in Welsh and the way you write in Welsh can sometimes be really different. I think. I don't know if that's the same in other languages. I don't know. I but know. I don't really know enough about it because, mm. as discussed, I hadn't read a novel yeah. in years. Um, but this was really easy to read. It's um, told from the point of view of a woman and her son and it's kind of alternate point of view. And each chapter is just like really short anyway. So it's just like, you know, a couple of pages for each chapter. Um, and it's like a it's a post-apocalyptic novel. Um, you know something's happened and that they're kind of just alone. Well, it's the mum, um, the son, and then there's a little baby as well. But she obviously doesn't have like a, a voice in it. Um, 
and the, they've got this notebook, which is their Flavoured Glass Nebo, so it just means the Blue Book of Nebo, which is a place. And um, in the notebook, the boy, who's kind of a teenager, he's writing about what's happening now, so his day-to-day -day life now, and then the mum is writing about what happened before, but they're not meant to read each other's stories. And it's just partly because um, like he can't go to school anymore, and you know he likes writing, and before this apocalypse... Is that right? Um, happens the mum has gone to the library and just like the library's been trashed but she's taken all the welsh books so he's just kind of been reading welsh books and it has a lot about welsh books in it which mm. i really like because it made me think oh i could read yeah. these as well i would recommend it if you're a bit nervous about reading welsh books yeah. and you could speak welsh this is perfect I, I think you know if you're learning and you're kind of quite advanced learner then, then right. Yeah. It feels like it's one that a lot of Welsh speakers have read and, taken off a bit. Yeah, and really liked. Yeah. So um, it reminds me a bit of Station Eleven type oh, feel as well. Yeah. So, yeah. They talk a lot this morning. Not more than usual, sweet. <laughs> <laughs>
So, you know, that's mm. interesting. So it's interesting. Um, so, yeah, anyone uh, else reading this? Don't just let me be on my own here. <laughs> it's kind of when she starts in the music business and they just tell her as soon as she gets a record deal, she has to lose weight. And there's just loads about people just telling her to lose weight all the time or dress sexy and stuff she's not comfortable with and making her do it to get on MTV and all that kind of stuff. And it feels feels a little bit sad. But there you go. And she says she's just starving the whole time. Yeah, it kind of feels sad. Yeah. So, you know, I'm glad she's happy now. Yeah. Yeah. There's one time Celine Dion phones her as well. That's a good moment. Mm. Yeah, she cries. Mm. Mm. Yay! Hi team, I'm going to tell you what I am currently reading because I thought you might like to know. I am doing two buddy reads at the moment, which have both started this week. Um, the first of which I'm doing with Sean as well as Sarah from Your True Shelf and Charlotte from Tired Mama Tries to Read. Um, we are reading In a Summer Season by... Um, Elizabeth Taylor, um, the author Elizabeth Taylor, just to clarify. And um, yes, it's like an early 60s novel. It's on the Virago modern classics range. Um, so yeah, one day into this um, at the moment. And so I've read like one chapter and I'm sort of midway through the second one. Um, I'm really enjoying it. Um, it's my first Elizabeth Taylor. Um, yeah, it just seems to be about... Um, this woman called Kate and she is married to a guy um, called Dermot who is like 10 years younger uh, than her and I think that's kind of more of an issue at, that, at this point in time and it's she's quite concerned with like you know being middle-aged and how that I think at the time also sort of seemed pretty old and um, so they've got two kids and they live with their aunt um, so yeah at the moment it's quite cute I'm enjoying it it's got a sort of sense seems to be sort of quite gently kind of mocking of of the middle classes and things like that at the moment um i like that dermot's um growing mushrooms but or trying to grow mushrooms um but it's not going too well um yeah i'm thinking i'm gonna really enjoy this one my other buddy read is um foul is fair by hannah capin capin i'm reading this with my buddy amy um so again just started this is a young adult a uh, new young adult book, and it's about kind of these um, four best friends rule their glittering LA circle. They're kind of like the queen bees of their high school, um, and one of them's just turned 16, and they've all gone to this party, and this incident that occurs at the party, um, which hasn't quite sort of come to light what it is, but it seems to be like she was, um, what's it, you know, when the, she had her drink spiked, and um, there's been some kind of like a date rape type scenario that's happened with the guys from this party from this other school so they have vowed to seek revenge on um on the guys from the party and i think they're going to kill them hopefully um so yeah i'm gonna really enjoy this one it's kind of trashy um the writing is quite almost like quite cartoony and brash um kind of ridiculous but you know super fun as well um that's kind of what I'm reading. I have also bought a couple of books. Now I am on a book buying ban, um, loosely, I would say. We're reading our shelves, but we've done pretty well. We've done so, amazing. Yeah, and I was um, I was kind of in town the other day and looking around um, in Waterstones, and there's a couple of books that caught my eye, and then I went home later on, and I was like, I really want to get them, and I went back out, and it shut. So I went online and bought them. And one of those is Cherry. And this is by Nico Walker. And this is a book that I've kind of had my eye on for quite a while. And I uh, hadn't seen it out in the UK um, up until now. So this one, um, I love the cover. Um, it's I think it's going to be quite hard hitting. I think it's quite autobiographical. I think it's basically there's sort of quite a lot about drugs in here the guy um, goes to fight I think in Iraq and is quite sort of traumatized with like sort of PTSD um, from that as well um, I think uh, I'm pretty sure this novel was written from prison so I think the author is currently in prison and I think they're making like a, a TV thing or a film on it but um I heard so much good stuff about this when it came out um, I think it's going to be one of those quite sort of um, intense reads that sort of sticks with you. So 
I'm interested. I, I, I want to get to this one quite soon. And the other one I saw, this is by um, Leila Slimani, who um, wrote, um, is it a nanny? Uh, is that the, is yeah. That the book? Yeah. Um, it's called The Lullaby, I think, though, in America. Oh, it's Lullaby. Yeah. Yeah. Nanny, yeah. 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 Um, and this is Sex and Lies. So this is non-fiction. And basically it's essays, um, her speaking, talking to um, women in Morocco. Um, and I think a lot of them are sex workers. Um, it says, in Morocco, the only acceptable sexual activity is between a man and his wife, where all forms of extramarital sex, homosexuality and prostitution are not only morally frowned upon, but also punishable by law. Women appear to have two options, to be a virgin or be a wife. Um, so yeah, uh, she just goes around speaking to these women, giving them a bit of a voice, and um, this just appealed to me. I just kind of I sort of picked it up and started flicking through it, and I thought it just was immediately really interesting. Um, so yeah, I haven't read her other books, but um, this one really appealed to me. 